And uh, now I'd like to introduce Hiram Anderson. Uh, he's a fellow data scientist at Endgame. I'm lucky enough to work with him every day. And he said he has, there's nothing quirky about him, but that's a lie because he told a story about an owl last year, and that was great. So, Hiram. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Um, uh, excellent talk, Scott. Um, this, this is a, a great segue into to what I'd like to talk about today. And um, I guess by way of inter introduction, this, this, is a, this is a presentation about features, okay? And about what it means to learn features that have more than representation for good, bad, but representation that you might use for other things. And, and by way of, I guess, um, um, you know, my, my own opinions about some of the questions that were asked is I, I do agree with Scott that, um, Unlike recent applications of end-to-end -end deep learning for image recognition and machine translation, um, I, I believe also with Scott, and not speaking for FireEye or Endgame, that uh, handcrafted features still represent the state of the art uh, for, for machine learning um, mal static malware classification, at least for PE files. Um, and, and I'll actually show a few slides that sort of drive that point home today. And, and second, um, the, the question that really said about this research is um, the fact that when we go about training end-to-end -end models for uh, static malware classification, they're extremely hungry for labels. And uh, you can think about a scenario in which those labels are dirty or they don't come for free anymore or maybe your source of labels is, is cut off, then, then what do you do, especially for in deep, in deep learning and sort of those sort of models are going to be kind of the first to be hurt by a label shortage or a label poisoning. So I'm going to present a few ideas um, about unsupervised and semi-supervised approaches to learn feature representations that are useful for tasks that include good-bad, but also include other tasks. And just to remind you why this is a hard problem is uh, for many of the reasons that Scott more eloquently pointed out, the, the PE file is, um, well, First of all, static malware classification is an undecidable problem, right? It's, it's akin to the stopping problem in computer science. And so instead, a static malware class classification sort of looks at the artifacts of maliciousness or benignness and tries to make a determination that way. Um, second, the, the PE file format is, is obviously quite structured, although uh, you'll all appreciate that the Windows loader doesn't, you know, necessarily care so much about how well that structure is followed. So that presents a, a tremendous opportunity for malware authors to sneak in things that will break your parser, but the Windows loader will say that's fine. So um, the undecidable nature and the parsing mess notwithstanding, um, when it works, static classific file classification is really cool because um, now you can tell before you, you know, before you run the file whether or not it's good or bad. And, um, and, and I, I think that it actually encapsulates how a lot of uh, modern machine learning AV, next gen AV, if you will, um, uh, systems work today is using many static features. So with that, I, I wanna um, just introduce what I'm gonna talk about in detail today. And first, I, I wanna show a few slides that uh, point out, a, sort of just draw that distinction about, um, about how uh, end to end still is improving, but is still not quite up there with um, with handcrafted features, um, and that's on many different things. It's it's yes, it's good bad, um, but it's also in in label budget, and it's also in doing other tasks, not good bad, like similarity tasks. Um, so the goal, really, the goal of, of this talk, and what I set out to do, is is tackle these two things. How can I um, create a feature representation? Um, in an automatic sort of way that is um, invariant to some nuisance parameters that, that cause, uh, that, that might creep into sort of end-to-end uh, -end deep learning feature learners. Um, and second, I want to sort of reduce the appetite for labels. So of all the approaches I'm going to speak about today, none of them are fully supervised. So I don't want, I want to be able to learn a representation that don't require me to know if the file is good or bad. I might know something, many, many other things about it, but I don't know whether it's malicious or benign. And I'm gonna introduce, you know, for like all unsupervised tasks, you kind of have to play a game with a new objective function. So um, this is kind of fun, this is a fun part of the research. I, I'm uh, gonna talk about three, three different games that we'll have our machine learning model play um, that are surrogates to 
uh, learning and representation that are useful for other things. Okay, so um, I, I just want to put a little finer point on why representation is so important. And um, we want to learn a good representation uh, for a PE file. You know, PE files are raggedy in length, but we want to have a fixed size vector. And what, I, what a good representation, I think, entails is a good level of abstraction. So um, when you have abstraction, you can in codify higher level, um, more general concepts that are generally less sensitive to local changes. So for example, um, for, for an image or for object classification, it's much more useful to have a feature that denotes pointy ears because pointy ears means I can spot a certain style of dog rather than you know, the, the arrangement and intensity of edges in image. So that kind of abstraction of features is useful and furthermore um, allows us to learn new concepts pretty easily. So that gets to this idea of uh, few shot learning and being less hungry for labels. If we can come up with a feature representation that um, is general and where features are disentangled, so a specific case of disentanglement in a static <coughs> malware classification is, um, uh, you know, static malware can have a hard time with packed files. And packed is often confused with malicious. So if we can disentangle the notions of packed and maliciousness, that, that's a useful thing. And, and finally, a good representation should um, not be good at only one task, but should be able to solve some other tasks, like, um, like are these structurally similar? So um, the data sets and, and models we'll talk about today include the following. The first is Ember that was released by Phil Roth and, and myself earlier this year. And Ember is both a data set um, so I Ember is just a, a, a data set that contains extracted, handcrafted features. And there's, there's 1.1 million files there. But importantly, the, the kind of features that are extracted of, are of two sorts. The first are the parsed kind. I had to understand the file format in order to get out the header information, the sections, the imports, etc. And the second type are raw. So they're just bytes. Um, they're, they're, they're bytes or entropy that I can sort of just take in uh, uh, raw bytes without understanding the file format. And the second part of em Ember is actually, um, you know, we, we trained a model and it was, it was literally import light GBM and dot fit. Like there, there was no, in the paper that we released, there was no hyperparameter optimization um, in that model. And in that paper we showed that Malcon, which I'll talk about next, actually came in, in Ed's words, Ed the author, it came within spitting distance of, of the, uh, the handcrafted feature model. So Malcon, um, just in a word, is, is very much like the, the model that uh, Scott presented. It's different in a few important ways. Um, it, it's a small model. It only, has, um, it only has 128 different sort of filters in it. So it's only looking for 128 different things in a fuzzy way. But it does take in a whole megabyte of the file as opposed to a smaller chunk. So um, um, w the, the Malconv I'll be talking about today is actually not trained by Ed, but trained by us on the same samples that we used for Ember. So we can have kind of a, uh, a apples to apples comparison. And here's what you get. So this is point number one uh, that uh, I think uh, builds some evidence for what Scott was, was talking about is that, you know, it's true. So here, this Ember model, I actually did a grid search and tried to optimize the parameters. And it's kind of clear that, um, that the handcrafted Ember features, even at extremely low false positive rates, um, really, you know, uh, the Malconv is, is really struggling to compete with it. Um, furthermore, if I go into Ember and I throw away all the features that I use from a parser, so now I don't even have to understand what the file is. I'm using unigram bytes and entropy. Still, that model is, is much, much better than, than what's learned end to end by, by Malconv. Um, so Malconv is promising. Um, Malconv is only using 120 dimensions. You know, um, I didn't test it, but I, I have a hypothesis, but by increasing that, you could, you could get a lot better. Um, whereas Ember has you know, uh, hundreds or even a thousand, thousands of dimensions. So another point I, I want to uh, make is that um, let's, uh, let's see if we can use these features for other tasks. So 
Let me take the raw Ember features, and I'm going to choose a few holdout samples and um, UPX pack them. And you probably can't read this, but what's important here is that on the on the left hand side, I'm color coding an embedding of these features by their UPX packing level. I pack them myself, so I know what it is. And on the on the right hand side, I'm showing you the Microsoft family name. Okay. And what's what you should notice here is that there's there's a pretty good clustering by micro by Microsoft family name, but a kind of poor clustering by UPX. There, there's a little bit here, um, the, the oranges and, and reds. But Ember kind of does a good job of separating those features. So when, when you look at the same thing with the Malcon features, and here what I did is I sort of just ripped out what the features are before the, before like the multi-layer perceptron at the bottom. Um, you see that it's actually king really strongly on the UPX packing level rather than the Microsoft familyness. So that, you know, that leaves something to be desired. One wants to learn a feature representation that does a little bit better. So the other point is uh, the label hungriness. Um, you know, uh, Malcon, I, I trained with 600,000 samples, but it turns out if you, if you train with um, you know, 20 or 30 times fewer samples with Ember, you get similar performance. So that speaks to how hungry this end-to-end deep learning is for labels. OK, so the task now is to. Um, find a way to use fewer labels and get a little bit better disentanglement of our features in an end to end deep learning uh, scenario. So the first task I'll introduce is, is taken from, um, from Neruzzi and Favaro in, in a computer vision. And it's a really simple task. I'm gonna tile up an object and uh, scramble them with a known per permutation known to me and use that as a label uh, for a supervised learning model. So this is called self-supervised learning, where the label is created wholly from the input data. And I'll do this exact same thing, but for a PE file. So instead of three puzzle pieces, I'll take uh, three uh, strings of bytes that are 16 kilobytes long. I will shuffle them in a permutation that I know, and I'll try to predict, predict that permutation using kind of a Siamese-ified Malconv network. So <clears throat> to be clear, um, the, 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 uh, the sequences go in at the top, uh, features are put at the bottom, those weights are shared between the Malcon uh, architectures, and then there's just a simple multi-layer perceptron that chooses as an output the permutation number that I use to create the puzzle. And it turns out that you can't solve this very well. I can train it to an accuracy, a validation accuracy of 40%. So it nails this puzzle four times out of 10. But uh, that, that's not very good. Nevertheless, the features that are learned from this um, can be used to train a model, but not a very good one. So um, the green line now, I've just added to the chart you've seen already, the green line represents the rock curve for these features trained with no labels, with only self-supervised labels. So um, not, not, you shouldn't get too excited about this, but um, the sad news is it doesn't get much better than this either. So um, um, the other things it does, though, it, it does do a better job of disentangling rep representations and the, the uh, hungriness for labels. <clears throat> so one thing we can do now with uh, this jigsaw puzzle features that we couldn't do with Malcon is we've separated uh, labels from features in an intended way. And now I can train a model use, using how many ever uh, labels I'd like to. So this, uh, in this plot, we see that um, um, at no point does a jigsaw uh, surpass a fully labeled Malconf model, but um, it gets decent performance even by having or taking 10 times less of the data set. Furthermore, um, there's uh, some disentanglement going on. Um, well, we, we, we want to get disentanglement rather, but you'll see that jigsaw actually learns very well the packing level. So this, we're in, a, we're in a no better spot, really, than we were when we began. Okay, so task number two, let's think of a new creative way to, um, a new task that can act as a surrogate. And the second task will be uh, simple. I'll, I'll get a batch of samples, and I'll put things that are similar into the same bin, and things that are different into different bins. And similar and different will not be by using the label, but by using other information that's cheap to get about the sample. So, for example, um, if, I, if I had labels, I would certainly use them. 
And in the experiments I'll show you, I actually had, I think, 1% of the, the uh, uh, data is labeled. But I'll also use cheap site information, such that, like I can get from a file command. Or, um, and I'll also use uh, this notion of self-similarity. So for every file I get, I can, I can pack it myself, and I know that these two things should go in the same bin, the packed and the unpacked version. And that will um, hopefully allow me to automatically learn an invariance to packing. <coughs> now, the, this, um, this, uh, this binning thing that I'm going to show you, um, especially because of self-similarity, there's an infinite number of bins. And that's bad because of collisions. So um, with a probability approaching one, I will have a collision. But a trick is to have a whole forest of binners. And each of these binners have a different, uh, different binning task. They bin it in a slightly different way. So that um, with probability approaching zero, are things binned in every binner in the same way. So I, I learned to separate. You can kind of do some logic, right, like a mastermind game about what should be separated, what should not, if you look at this learning task. And at the end of the day, uh, uh, collisions in any one binner is OK, because uh, at the end of the day, we only get the, about the features, not about the output of the model. So what do these, uh, what do these features do? Well, first, um, they don't perform very well at all in a classification task. Um, um, this was disappointing to me. I'll, I'll be honest, very disappointing to me. I thought this would be good. Um, what it does do very well is it separates the notion of packedness from benignness. So, um, so UPX packing level, you should see all sorts of colors that uh, belong to the same sample, but are overlapping each other in this um, embedding. And Microsoft family kind of goes together. All right, the few minutes I have left, I want to introduce a third task um, for unsupervised learning of features that is very much related to um, autoencoders. And um, so quick review, uh, a traditional autoencoder just tries to reconstruct the output, or reconstruct the input. Um, and a downside of that is that the features I get um, lie in this space where um, if I choose a point at random in this space, it doesn't necessarily correspond to um, a, a real input, right? So um, one of the benefits of variational autoencoders is Instead of predicting um, at the belt features, they predict a distribution over features. And this allows you to reason about things between the betweenness of features, so that if I pick any point in this, this space, um, I can you know, invent uh, a, an input that, that would exist there. So I'm going to take this notion of variational autoencoder and um, use it to build in invariance to packing in the following way. So instead of reconstructing the input, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sample, and uh, I'll get it, and I'll pack it. And now I'll put the packed version at the input, and I'll try to reconstruct the unpacked version, right? So the features are forced to learn something that is invariant to packing, something that is, uh, doesn't depend on packing. And probably that's mostly just the header information, right? Um, Furthermore, I'm going to add in this belt area features that represent uh, the UPX packiness level. So um, he, what I've done here explicitly is in this architecture is tried to disambiguate and disentangle by, by structure of the model what it means to be, uh, what, it means to be um, what it means to represent the malware and whether or not it's packed. So this is a, a fully unsupervised problem. Uh, the only labels, it's self-supervised. The only labels I give it are the labels I've created myself. And uh, here's what you get. When I uh, embed these features, you should see that um, there, it, it's totally not dependent on, so first, the, the file features are totally not dependent on the packing level. They're, they cluster uh, better by Microsoft family name. Um, furthermore. If I, I can take a look at these auxiliary labels that represent packiness, and they are uh, perfect descriptors of packiness alone, but don't at all predict the Microsoft family label. So I, I forced this disentanglement, which was a design goal. Um, so sad news is that I was unable to do this for um, Malconf. Actually, I was able, but I lost VPN access, and the results are sitting in Atlanta right now. So uh, stay tuned for, uh, if you'd like to know more, let's, let's correspond over email. These results were actually given, uh, done using Ember as input and Ember as output, okay? So 
Ember feature input, I packed the original sample, re-extracted Ember features, right? That just was like 150 times faster. Okay, um, do these work well for classifying? The answer is yes. Um, so these are, the, the purple line is the new one here. Um, these are not as good still as the original Ember, nor are they as good as the uh, Ember with, uh, with only uh, byte level features. Um, but they do provide this interesting representation um, and allows you to, to reason about things having used no labels at all. Finally, I can use these labels again um, by downsampling, by, by selecting uh, very, very few labels for a supervised learning problem, I can create a model um, that is competitive with the other models. Okay, I am finished with my main talk. The, the key points I hope that you would take away is um, uh, a confirmation, I think, uh, an agreement with Scott that handcrafted still represent the state of the art, and I hope that will change. I hope that we can uh, you know, think about new ways to design architectures that will help our end-to-end -end deep learning systems uh, learn representations in a better way. Um, uh, I hope that you'll take away the, the importance of learning representations that disentangle, uh, especially nuisance parameters, from the representation you care about. And I've showed you three toy problems uh, that act as surrogates for learning, um, for learning in an unsupervised way what these features could be. The jigsaw, the softbacks forest, and the variational equivalence encoder. All right, thank you. Hey, thank you for all the positive comments. Um, uh, actually, one thing that came to mind when you were talking about um, sort of uh, some of your results towards the end is uh, if you've done any comparison to like using something like Decov uh, as a, as I know that that's used to kind of, again, disentangle in some ways um, these feature representations. I think even the Malcolm paper mentions, uh, who knows how much and when they used it, but uh, that they'd use this Decov um, approach. I didn't know if you had any comments or thoughts uh, comparing the two. I, I have not compared them. I, I would love to have actually just finish the experiments I presented. So that, that will be added to my queue though, Scott. Thank you. Great talk. You had a slide in the beginning there that had a little diagram of a multitask network and that sort of gets at the heart of um, you know what you're interested in here. And actually Rich and I were, were talking during the break about do the, do the ideas of uh, domain adaptation and transfer learning, you know, that we've seen be su so successful in computer vision, how can we apply it uh, to malware analysis? And we were sort of speculating that, uh, you know, some of the reasons that might work in vision is that low-level features like edge detection are universally useful. Um, and, you know, what would it take for it to work in malware analysis? Uh, would an easy thing be to, to try to swap the features from your different surrogate tasks and try them on each other and see if it works at all? Oh, yeah, like enable all the surrogate tasks at once? Is that, that, the that would be one thing. And then the second thing would just be, you know, the jigsaw features applied to the third thing and vice versa. Yeah. Um, um, I haven't given that a lot of thought, but I, my, my, my fear is that the, the um, information processing theorem will work against us, right? The loss of information as we continue to process. So... Um, the jigsaw tax itself didn't actually work that well for, for good bad. So I, I, you know, I'd be surprised if anything could come from that which would boost it, right? But um, for a representation, I think that's a great idea. If, if, if your point is not good bad, but your point is to compare you know, structural similarity, I think that'd be a great way to go. Thank you. Uh, question, um, your experience on this, this uh, the thing you just discussed, do you see any difference in your approach if you have numerical, categorical features kind of all mix up, kind of very, kind, do you see any difference in approach that you would take if it's a mixture of numerical and categorical? Yeah, as a matter of fact, the Ember uh, data set contains both, uh, both numerical and categorical data. The categorical data is either um, it's either like one hot encoded, or we're using a hashing trick to sort of bend or histogram the categorical data in some way. Quick, quick extension on that. So, if it's pure numerical or pure categorical, would you change your approach? Um, 
I, I can't think of a reason I would change it, but it's a good, I'll give it some thought. That's a good question. So you're testing with a, an entropy-based packer. Do you have any sense of whether it would work as well with a virtualization-based packer, such as VMProtect? Yeah, well, I, I'd like to chase this down, but I suspect that the invariance to UPX has nothing to do with the contents of the file, but only of the header, right? Does that make sense? So um, for those same reasons, it would work just as good or just as poorly, whatever your take is. Um, um, yeah. I don't think there's, it's learning anything special about UPX. Um, I believe that, in fact, that in the last example where we learned sort of the UPX-ness level, I think it's sort of uh, a surrogate for learning entropy, right? And the higher the entropy, the higher the packing level. So your convolutional layer was with, with 500, stride 500, uh, which was, is that? Uh, yeah, actually, well, let's chat offline. I actually had to modify Malcom in, in subtle ways to make it learn anything at all at these tasks. Ah, and interesting. One of the things was making, the problem with the Stride 500 is you, you've totally lost, you've totally lost, you've, um, you, you've aliased yourself, so you've lost any intermediate information. So I reduced the Stride to like 10. I also added batch norm, and actually added um, a single dense layer the thing with Malconv also, it's only learning linear activations, essentially. It's not a linear activation, but there's only a single layer. So it can only learn, learn a linear sort of boundary at that level. So I added a single, um, a single dense layer after that. Was um, the main design consideration mostly around uh, sequence size? Because you said you were working at one megabyte, so you work uh, due to memory constraints or something like that? Uh, the primary motivation was to use something that was published in the literature. Um, that's pretty much it. And, but then again, I had to change it to make it work for, to do my bidding. So, can't have it both ways, I guess. The one question Hiram gave me was actually a question to the audience, which I thought was cheating, which was, uh, can anyone think of any other ways to represent a, a file or another task to add to his list? Um, but I don't think I'll wait for an answer. I just think I'll let that hang, and uh, you can talk to Hiram if you have an idea later. So let's thank, thank him one more time. Thank